Dear Yiv, Kerd Mila Falcha, August Mila Buikus, Tush Gwil Shivling and Oct, Eron, Okad Fierce Bishil to show on Kuigu Capital Irish Film Festival, Deog, the Solis Nua. Good evening to you all. I'm Paddy Meskel, co chair of Solis Nua. We bring the best of contemporary Irish arts to North America and beyond. And I am delighted to be here with Ambassador Dan Mulhall, the Irish ambassador to the United States, to discuss Irish filmmaking, um, Irish films, and Irish arts and culture. And before we get to a conversation with Ambassador Mulhall, I would just like to say that normally we'd be in the beautiful confines of the American Film Institute in Silver Spring. We'd have some drinks maybe, we'd have a crush of bodies, and we would be celebrating and introducing uh, the Festival of Irish Films, which we are about to put on. But COVID has put a stop to that, but the show will go on and the show must go on. So instead, through the miracle of technology, we now actually have expanded our audience. And the Capital Irish Film Festival, instead of being just available now to Washington audiences, is being available to audiences across the United States and its territories. We are delighted for that. We have a very, very diverse and interesting uh, program of films, and we have some incredible conversations and talkbacks organized with writers, directors, and filmmakers from Ireland. So we look forward to that. But I would like to, first of all, welcome you warmly, Ambassador Mulhall, and to thank you personally and your staff at the Irish Embassy in Washington, the Department of Foreign Affairs, Culture Ireland, Screen Ireland, and the Arts Council, not just for your continued support of Solis Nua and our work, but the continued support and promotion of Irish arts and culture across the United States. And so thank you for that. And I suppose to start our conversation, Ambassador Mulhall, you know, Solis Nua has been presenting this film festival for 15 years. In that time, Irish film has emerged uh, uh, having a global force and a global impact. Would you talk to that, Ambassador Mulhall, what you see are the reasons, the sources, and where you think we're going? Just like Barra, a foreign Gurimil Magut, a sucked on Kura Velat on Shah Kun Kursi Scanon here in the Flay August Kun on 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 Fela Morshaw, a Kunlart Mayor on Fela Morshaw. So thank you very much, Paddy, and your your team at Solis Nua for inviting me to take part in this 15th capital Irish Film Festival. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to uh, be involved. Obviously, I'd love to be <laughs> going out to the cinema and sitting there in a normal kind of cinema environment, uh, watching these these great films, uh, representing the Irish film industry as it is today, but that's not possible. So we have to make do with things as they can be. And and uh, well done to you for, for, for turning this festival into a virtual festival and for taking advantage of the opportunity to reach um, Higher, bigger audiences and more diverse audiences because you can reach people that are not in Washington DC but anywhere really in the world or certainly anywhere around the United States uh, can tune in uh, to watch these uh, films. So well, look, um, I have had um, relatively long now association with the Irish film industry because I, I happen to have been assigned uh, to three countries where film, Irish film is pretty big uh, I'm talking about uh, Berlin, where every year I would attend the Berlin Alley and there would always be an Irish film interest in the Berlin Alley. And I, I often uh, uh, remember walking down the red carpet, uh, going into the uh, to see the uh, films. Um, and very often there were Irish actors, Irish directors or uh, Film Ireland was usually there. We'd host an event uh, for them at the embassy. So I, I got to know people from the Irish film industry and I got to realize that it was a growing industry and becoming more and more important uh, uh, to Ireland. Then I was in London where, um, you know, there's an Irish film festival held every year and where Irish film was 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 quite popular, obviously, um, among people in, in, in Britain generally, but in particular among, you know, the Irish in Britain who are, who are, who are very numerous, about three quarters of a million Irish born people live in Britain today. Um, and many more, of course, have an interest in Ireland through family or other uh, connections. Um, and then, of course, coming to Washington and being able to come every year to the, uh, you know, to the capital Irish uh, 
film festival, and also visiting um, some of the studios in California with Film Ireland a couple of years ago. That was a great treat as well, because, you know, I mean, even for a, for a man of my age, visiting Disney is, is no small thing, <laughs> as you can imagine. And also, you know, being in, being in Hollywood, I, I, I got a great kick out of, out of doing an event in Hollywood. Uh, you know, I felt I, was, I felt I had arrived and I, I, I hoped somebody might spot me and say that I could do, you know, I could play a role in some, you know, in some Netflix drama as a cranky old ambassador or whatever. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm available to anyone out there who's interested in, uh, you know, in having a person <laughs> in my um, background on screen. But anyway, uh, so here, here's what I think. Um, the Irish were good storytellers, right? I mean, if you go back to, you know, you know uh, the very old days, I'm talking about, you know, the pre-19th century, say. The, 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 I mean, the mainstay of Ireland, of social life in Ireland was the, people you know, it was a rural society and people came together and they told stories and that was the kind of um and they played music and they did you know they sang and they did uh, you know and uh, and they danced together so that rural society was a society where storytelling or maybe you call it gossip <laughs> was important but people were good at telling stories and we had a very good literary tradition in ireland going back i mean if you go back you can go back more than a thousand years and you'll find uh, Irish monks uh, writing poems in the margins of their manuscripts. Um, last week, I, I, I tweeted a, a, a poem from a 13th century Irish um, uh, woman poet uh, called uh, Gilavreda McNamee. And she wrote a poem in the late 13th century about being childless and asking God to intervene and give her a child. And it was a powerful poem, I thought. So, you know, we've had a tradition of literature in the Irish language going back to, you know, the Middle Ages and beyond more than a thousand years of literary history. And then in the 19th century, we transferred our literary um, um, reputation developed in the English language, uh, you know, through, um, I suppose, Thomas More initially, but also in the 18th century through Swift and Goldsmith and Sheridan and those people in Burke. And then the 19th century, a, a very strong tradition developed of, of writing W.B. Yeats, obviously later on James Joyce, Sean O'Casey, John Bennington Singh, and, and so on. And to this very day, we have a strong uh, literary presence. If you go to any bookshop in the world, you will find uh, Irish books by Irish authors are prominently available there. And I suppose uh, until maybe 20, 30 years ago, most films about Ireland were made by people from outside of Ireland. You know, you think of the man of Aaron, you think of the quiet man, you know, you think of uh, Ryan's daughter, you know, movies like that. And shall we say, Darby, you know, Darby or Given the Little People, for example, shall we say the image of Ireland was rather, um, it, it, it was lovely, it was good for the country in that it, it probably drew, drew tourists to our shores at uh, times when we needed them. I'm, 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 I'm sure the quiet man did a huge amount for, for, you know, for Irish tourism. Uh, I mean, I, I was, I was intrigued that uh, last year NYU did a survey of younger Irish Americans and they asked them what was their image of Ireland and the quiet man turned out to be one of the images that uh, people could relate to. So, but that's, I don't, I don't bemoan that fact. I, I take it as just a, a part of reality that people have images of Ireland, which are not, perhaps what we would design ourselves today. But I think in the last 30 years, there's been more of an effort made by Irish writers and Irish directors to produce films about Ireland that, that actually relate to contemporary Ireland, as opposed to people from outside of Ireland viewing us and maybe getting a slightly kind of skewed vision of Ireland as a result. And I think of, you know, The Commitments, for example, is a very good example of an early film that was quintessentially Irish um, mm. and, you know, was all the better for that. And, uh, and then, you know, over the years, we've had so many other films that have, that have, that have sort of spoken of, of, um, of contemporary Ireland. And I remember once I, when I was in Edinburgh, I screened as part of a local festival there. I, 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 I arranged... Um, for that film written by Roddy Doyle and based on something he wrote when it wasn't, it was when, when something meant, when, when Trudy met whatever. And it was a film that was about a dysfunctional, violent sort of couple. Now it was a kind of a Roddy Doyle, typical Roddy Doyle. It was, it was also humorous in its own way, but it, 
but it shall we say it it didn't exactly uh project the image of ireland that you know we might have been ideally wanting to project but and people ask me this question said well why you know why are you um why are you sort of hosting a, a film like this which clearly you know presents a slightly kind of um uh you know um seedy view of ireland or i mean i mean, albeit done in a humorous way and i said look my view is that we we have to speak of the reality of our country and we have to we have to grapple with the reality and it's only by doing that that we can actually move forward as a people as a society so i certainly welcome the fact that that um Irish filmmakers have have emerged and that we have now a quantity and quality of output by Irish directors and films made in Ireland that speak to the realities of Ireland. And I mean, I would have thought that, you know, Normal People, which screened here last year, probably did a lot for, you know, changing people's image of Ireland. A lot of Americans saw that film and probably thought, hey, this is an interesting place. You know, it, it's not the place that we maybe dreamt of in our misty dreams but it's a place yeah, that yeah. Uh, you know has an interesting kind of yeah. contemporary reality which and i think was well presented in that in, in that series and to your point ambassador i mean so you obviously see the arts and film as a way of of informing people about a new there's a new ireland I, i'm speaking to you now from limerick in ireland and as i've just yeah. come back from a walk and i've packed, passed several families of color some of them speaking different languages one of them beautifully a family of, of, of dark color actually speaking Irish together. So film and arts as a way of portraying an Ireland that's changing, that's diverse, that obviously is important. Yeah, and look, it's the best way of doing it. I, I've discovered over the course of my now 40 year plus career that the arts from Ireland open doors for us that would not be available to us if we didn't have a strong cultural offering in terms of literature, music, and dance. I mean, we happen to be a very fortunate people. There are only 5 million of us in our state, 7 million on the island of Ireland. And yet, if you compare us with almost any other country of our size, and even countries much bigger than we are, our presence in the, the cultural, the global cultural scene is really quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, the fact that so many Irish writers are available uh, to be read all over the world, mainly because people all over the world can read and relate to English language output. And the fact that our output is in English is obviously a bonus for us. It's not something that we, we, that we intended. This is something that history, if you like, foisted upon us. Uh, but yeah. it has incidentally given us an opportunity to relate to the world and to convey images of Ireland to the world that we wouldn't have had had we not been in possession of a language that happened to become the global lingua franca. And, uh, right. you know, I, I know that, that, that you know, the, the, the decline and the, the um, um, eclipse of the Irish language as the main language of Ireland is a source of sorrow to many Irish people, including myself, by the way. But I do think that we have to be aware of the advantages that have accrued to us by the possession that history has given us, foisted right. upon us, if you like, of a language that has become the lingua franca of um, global communication. And, and as a historian ambassador, I know you will probably be aware that you know, in the, fest, the coming festival, starting on the 4th of March, we have two films on the famine, one Osgoelga Aracht, which is, a, which is Ireland's nomination to the Academy Awards for Best International Film. Yeah. And we also have a film called True North, which documents some of the lives of people who were born on the establishment of the Northern Ireland state. We have a film uh, about Martin McGuinness. So I think as a historian, you will maybe, you know, like the fact that we're using the festival to explore sometimes difficult and sensitive periods of our history and of our issues. Yes, and I remember a few years ago watching Black 47 mm -hmm. at the festival. And I remember that time, there was a panel discussion. I spoke at the festival as did you. Um, there was a panel discussion and one of the panelists asked the question, how many people here are Irish Americans? And literally everyone in the room put up their hands. And yeah. I think, now it doesn't mean that every one of those people are 
you know, 100% sort of Irish American, or that they have that that Irish, the Irish American identity is, is 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 the entirety of their identity. Probably not in most cases, but but the fact they came along to see that film, it, it's no coincidence that most that almost everyone in the room had an Irish background because right. in some way they acknowledge they recognize that the famine which that film depicted was the kind of the the origin story of Irish America and that's why I'm I'm, I'm glad to see Arrow and indeed the hunger as well uh being filmed this time around this year yes. because both of those relate to the history of the Irish in America because without the famine there would not have been an Irish America in the way that there is today so mm. For many, for maybe 35 or more million Americans, the famine is part of their origins. It's part of the right. reason why they happen to be born in America. And just on that point, Ambassador, just your thoughts about how the arts and film, you know, connect the diaspora uh, to Ireland, obviously, through their heritage and through their families and friends, even to the landscape, to the language. But also how, as we've talked about a little bit earlier, it also introduces people who have no... Uh, genealogical connection to to the people, but who are introduced to the Irish people and their in, and their personality and the way they are in the world. And so, we, would you just maybe finish our conversation just on that point about how important that is? Yes. Well, I have evidence of this from my now very long diplomatic career. In that, let me just give you a few examples. Um, I remember uh, in India in the early 80s, 40 years ago almost now, being invited to speak at the All India English Teachers Annual Conference to talk about W.B. Yeats because there was an interest in Yeats and this 23-year-old diplomat was invited to speak to 1,500 people who come from all over India for this conference and who in some way connected with Ireland through William Butler Yeats. I remember many years later, in, in Vietnam, um, launching a Vietnamese translation of James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. I remember thinking, wow, isn't this amazing that in faraway Vietnam, people actually want to read about a man who died you know, what, 70 years before and who was writing about a time more than 100 years before that launch took place in Vietnam. So, there's something about our, our literature that, that has a, a reach. And the same is true of, of um, dance, for example. I'm all the time, well, in normal times, not for the last year, obviously, but in normal times, I'm traveling widely in the United States. I, I think I've visited 30, 35 plus states over the last uh, uh, three and a half years, all of it in, in the first two and a half, nothing the last year. But nonetheless, nearly every time I traveled, I came across... Uh, a dance group and I would always meet the dancers after they had performed at whatever event I was I was I was speaking at or I was attending and I'd always ask them about their heritage now some of them certainly had Irish American heritage but many of them didn't have yeah. and don't have they were they were attracted to the dance because they like dancing and this was a, a a dance form that appealed to them and you know during the pandemic, this young dancer from Virginia, Morgan Bullock, has emerged as a kind of an internet, as an Instagram sensation, doing sort of, you know, very good versions of Irish dance, but with her own inimitable sort of, you know, um, you know, dynamism that she brings to the dance culture. The same is true of, I've come across people playing the fiddle, playing Irish tunes on the fiddle, at a very, very high level, and with no real Irish connection at all. Just, again, a love for the music. And the same is true of literature. You know, you meet people all over the country and all over the world who have an interest in Irish literature because they like it, because they think it's important, not because they, they have a grow for, you know, for our country. And then of course you come to, to the Irish around the world. And it's certainly true that, that, that they are enabled to connect with Ireland through our literature and, and, and through our culture, because not everyone can visit Ireland. Not everyone can move there for a year or study there or whatever. So for a lot of people, the culture is, the, is their, their, their prime, maybe their only connection with Ireland. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's important for that reason. And I don't ever underestimate 
the power of our culture. In fact, I, I emphasize it. I draw upon it whenever I can, whenever it's humanly possible. I highlight our cultural offering because I've realized that if I go to a place to talk about our politics, our foreign policy, or our economy, I will get a, a select audience. If I talk about WBH or James Joyce or Irish film or Irish culture or Irish history, because history is part of our culture as well, by the way, and, and don't forget that, I'll, I'll get a much bigger audience because people have an interest in it. And there's no point in trying to force people to listen to you talk about whatever it is is on your mind. Talk to them about the things they want to talk about, they want to hear about. Yeah. That's why I've been doing a lot of you know, talks on aspects of Irish history over the last uh, year or so, because I, f I feel that that's a more appropriate way of introducing people to Ireland, because yeah. it, it, it's, it plays to their interests, right. as opposed to you spoon feeding them stuff they don't want to know about. I mean, who wants to hear what the Irish GDP numbers were last year? Well, so, some people do, but, it, you know, but it's a minority interest. Whereas, you know, learning about the War of Independence or the coming of the Irish Free State, that's interest people. Yeah. And I always feel as well that, you know, when I was in Germany, especially, I did this a lot in that I, I did a lot of talks on Irish literature around the country. And there's a big interest in it there, you know, in, in Yeats, Joyce, Beckett, you name it, O'Casey as well. I found that I could, I could give a talk on Yeats or Joyce or whoever, and I would always preface the talk by saying, oh, by the way, you might have heard about some of the economic difficulties that we are encountering. This is 10 years ago during the economic and financial crisis. Here's my two minute version of that, which I would summarize for them. And then I would go on and talk about Yates and Joyce. And that to me was a, a perfect way of combining the things that people were interested in with the messaging that we were obliged to get across as part mm -hmm. of our role of diplomats. So in other words, I'm not saying you're exploiting literature and culture, but but you're you're using it as part of your public profile. Yeah. And for example, in my um, I, I do these regular I, I tweet some Irish poetry every day, and I do regular readings. And sometimes my readings can can attract 10, 15, 20,000 views, and that's a pretty extraordinary number. And it yeah. always amazes me. Yeah. And it just again speaks to the power of our, our literature, of our culture, our dance, our music, our song, in connecting us with people. And you know, the default position of a country with 5 million people is to be ignored internationally. And we are less prone to that fate for two reasons. One is the existence of the global Irish who give us a certain kind of profile that we wouldn't otherwise have. And the second is our culture which again enlarges the Irish footprint right. in ways that I think we, we have come to appreciate more and more in recent years. And I certainly, in, throughout my career, have, have, but particularly the last 20 years when I've been in high profile positions where I was able to do this stuff, uh, I've always drawn on our culture as a way of communicating Ireland to the world, a way, a way of telling our story, putting across our messaging about our country. And there's probably, I would say in the future, film will be a bigger and bigger part of that particular effort because I do think that the audiovisual sector is going to go from strength to strength. I'm not saying that, that it will um, eclipse reading in books. I don't think it ever will. People will always want to read books, I believe. But I do think that given the way in which audiovisual material is now ubiquitous you know it's on your phone it's on your your ipad it's on your computer it's on your television i do think that the 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 kind of expansion of the opportunities for for accessing audiovisual content is going to be more and more of a reality in the future and it's going to going to give more and more opportunities for irish filmmakers to use film communicate the reality of today's right. Ireland. And by the way, I never deride, I never criticize people who have an older view, a more traditional view of Ireland. I always say, that's fine. If that's how you relate to Ireland, I'm happy about that. If you think of the quiet man and that's what you uh, want to connect with Ireland through, 
that's fine by me. So my job is not to sort of shatter people's kind of images of Ireland, not to sort of take a hammer to them, but to take a paintbrush to them and to, to kind of color them in a little bit and try and, you know, make the, the appreciation of Ireland connect with the reality of Ireland, you know, more fully. And there, I think, film has a very important role to play. Well, Ambassador, I think anyone who knows you knows uh, that you keep a jam-packed schedule, even in COVID times. So I hope that you get a chance over from the 4th to the 14th to see some of the Irish films. I will certainly try. Can't thank, can't thank you enough. And just to acknowledge that the last time I chatted with you was the eve of the All-Ireland final, where you <laughs> boldly predicted that Waterford would win. And I'm very impressed that you have the resilience and the magnanimity to come back and chat with me again. So thank you very much, Ambassador Mulhall. Hopefully we'll have more of those conversations, both about uh, film and culture, and also the great game of hurling. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. There are some people and organizations I want to acknowledge and thank for their significant contributions to making this festival happen in 2021. In Ireland, to all the filmmakers, producers, writers, directors who enthusiastically have collaborated with us for conversations and talkbacks after the presentations, thank you very much. To Salmon Software Treasury Management Systems in Ireland for your very generous support of the Capital Irish Film Festival. In Washington, of course, the American Film Institute. We are so proud and grateful and appreciative of the continuing partnership with yourselves. Thank you very much. To Happy Medium Productions in Maryland, John Collins, keep burning it bright. To the Silver Spring Town Center, uh, thank you so much for your support. And to all the volunteers behind Solis Nua whose tireless work makes this happen. To the Solis Nua community in Washington, DC and beyond, we deeply appreciate your continued sponsorship, your encouragement and your engagement with Irish arts and Irish film through the film festival. It's the enjoyment and the stimulation and the community connection that you uh, build through this festival that makes it all worthwhile. To Pat Riley, to Pat Riley and to Michael Curlin, co-directors of the film festival, without your work, this would not happen. Your unstinting and tireless energy and your make it happen, can do, is featherling attitude makes the film festival uh, happen every year. Finally, to Mayor Muriel Bowser, the DC government and the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, your continued generous support is deeply, deeply appreciated. Over the 10 days from the 4th through the 14th, experience gripping features, thought-provoking and stimulating documentaries, whimsical, funny, uh, brilliantly made shorts, and a series of animation films that shows the universal messages in Irish mythology through cartoon films, series of uh, animation films. Get in the popcorn, get in the pizza, settle down, see you at the movies. <laughs>